Now we're going to jump over to talk about workshops that were really focused on the business of art. Universal Limited Art Editions, founded by Tatiana Grossman in 1957, was one of those. And you know how I said Tamarind was the first of three print shops we would talk about that were influential in the American printmaking movement? Well, ULAE is the second, and they could not be any more opposite. Where Tamarind found funding from the Ford Foundation so they could expose as many artists and as many printmakers as possible without cost, well, ULAE was a commercial printer, and they worked with just a very few number of artists. And where Tamarind sent artists home with their own prints to sell them, ULAE acted as the publisher. So they financially supported the project during the process, and then they marketed the art once it was complete. And where Tamarind insisted on that equal partnership between artist and printer, ULAE created more of a craftsman serves the artist environment. Tatiana defined the artist as a superior individual and she defined art as the creation of genius. She discouraged artists from learning the technical end of printing and she really courted the most recognized and influential artists of her time. She appealed to them with the idea that they could focus completely on the art and leave the craft to the master printer. And she really offered them the best of the best in master printers. Robert Blackburn was the first master printer at ULAE. Um, his approach, you know, it was so, so different than Tatiana's. He was so generous and open. He sponsored third world artists. Um, plus he was, he was a master printer and a genius artist. So, I just wonder what it must have been like for him working at her shop, which was so, so, so different than his own. At first, Tatiana couldn't get any established artists to come and print at ULAE because they really just weren't convinced that printmaking was a fine art medium. But Grossman was tenacious and um, she was very artist-centric, so she soon won over Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg. And they had such an innovative approach, such a creative approach that other well-known artists started to come to. Some of the artists who printed there were Robert Motherwell, Helen Frankenthaler, Robert Goodnow, Larry Rivers. This is a print by an artist named Robert Goodnow who printed at ULAE. He was a cubist inspired abstract expressionist. Goodnow printed 300 of these at Pratt in 1961. The Whitney Museum owns a copy of this one, but he also printed a colorless version, which can be seen at the Smithsonian. Then he printed these very similar ones at ULAE in the same year. I think it's really interesting to see him working on the same idea over and over, experimenting with more and less abstraction. This is an advertising poster printed at ULAE by an artist named Larry Rivers. And it's an example of something that I just think is crazy. Top artists of the time designed advertising posters for artistic endeavors like symphonies and art shows. They'd print large numbers and open edition to advertise the event, but then they would print a small number of signed limited edition prints for sale. Now, you read over and over about the struggle to make the art of printmaking legitimate, and it just seems like blurring the lines between graphic design advertising and fine art would just work against their goals, but I've seen lots and lots of these from important artists, so I guess they weren't concerned about it. Gemini GEL is the third of those three important workshops I told you about. It was launched in 1965 by Ken Tyler. Ken had been the technical director at Tamarind, and he really sort of got frustrated at Tamarind because he felt like they weren't as interested in technological advance as he was. He really wanted to push the envelope further and further in technology. And so he ended up attracting those hard edge artists and the pop artists who needed that kind of precision to do their work. Now, Tyler took a new and different approach to the artist printer relationship. Because this type of work was so precise and so technical, the artists really couldn't learn it and they had to rely on the printer. So you remember how at ULAE they had that sort of craftsman serves the artist approach. And then at Tamarind, they had more of an approach where the printer and the artist were partners, but the printer wasn't supposed to influence the artist at all uh, artistically. 
Well, Tyler encouraged the printer to influence the artist. This is how he described the relationship. You can't separate it. After a while, you don't know where the suggestions came from, the printer on the press, or that it was the artist's idea. But you know that something's going on there, and if it works, it's magic. Hard edge and pop artists required highly precise and technical processes to create their artwork. So they were the perfect challenge for Tyler. Tyler recognized that traditional methods really didn't serve them. And so he built new tools to accommodate those artists. He wanted to capitalize on new technologies and automation. He took risks and brazenly believed that anything could be done. At the same time, Tyler was really pushing the advancement of technical precision on the West Coast. Steve Paleski was doing the same on the East Coast at Chiron Press. Now he insisted on using real silk for all of the serographs. Um, he insisted on hand squeezing all the prints, which ended up um, leading to the, like this really, really highly saturated color. Um, Chiron printed for really all the great artists of the time, Lichtenstein, Warhol, Larry Rivers, Jim Dine, Helen Frankenthaler, Paul Jenkins, you could go on and on. This is a Steve Pileski print from 1968. Really gives you an idea of what the hard edge abstraction artists were doing. His work is in tons of collections, the Met, the Whitney, MoMA, the National Collection in Washington DC, and tons more. This is a Michael Knigan print. He bought Chiron Press from Tyler after he left his teaching post at Pratt Graphic Arts Center. This print is from an edition of 40. Again, you can really see the hard edge abstraction and minimalist influences. This is a Paul Jenkins print from 1969. He got his start at the Art Students League and he printed at Chiron much later. Jenkins created these amazing, colorful, fluid paintings, and he used all kinds of different methods to move the paint around the canvas, rolling and controlling the flow. I expect he must have done something similar with the chemicals on the stone to create these prints. At this point, American printmaking had really run the gamut. From the original days when Guy McCoy was experimenting with silkscreen as a new art form, all the way up to this point where Ken Tyler was breaking down the barriers between art and technology. But all of this technical perfection sort of led to a backlash. It led to a return to handcrafted artistry. Erwin Hollander, who had been a student of Tyler's and also had his own workshop, said it like this. He said, after a while, perfection had become boring. We longed for a printer smudge to give us something back to where the human is. In 1971, MoMA held an exhibition of these highly technical hard edge prints and the critics hated it. They railed against it. They said that, that technique had dominated over art. And they said money hungry artists were using the press to simply make reproductions instead of making art. After this, Tyler left Gemini and opened his own small shop. And there he focused more on smaller editions on handmade paper instead of technical perfection. And a lot of the great modern printers worked with him there. Frank Stella, Helen Frankenthaler, David Hockney. The great American modern artist Robert Motherwell became a regular at Tyler's shop. And he claimed that the Sunday afternoons that he spent with Tyler at the shop were among the happiest of his life. We've really come full circle. I'm back at the same place that I came to show you the first print of our video to show you the final one. I'm up on a ladder today so that I can show you this pair of Robert Motherwell serographs. These are from Motherwell's Africa Suite. It's really cool to have a pair of these to show you. I think the Tate is the only museum to have all 10 in the suite. Motherwell was a prolific printmaker and his work spans the entire period that we've just talked about. He was introduced to etching in the 1940s at Atelier 17 and then came back to printmaking in the 60s at ULAE. He printed just about at every workshop that we've talked about. Robert Blackburn's shop, Tamarind, Gemini, Chiron Press, at Tyler and Hollander's workshops. He was an important abstract expressionist, but even more than that, he really was the main intellectual driving force behind the movement. We're done! 
Motherwell was a great one to end on because he really, his work spanned the entire time we've been talking about from the 40s all the way up through the 70s and 80s. There isn't really just a perfect ending point for the American print renaissance. You know, people kept printing in, from the 80s beyond even today. Um, but we really kind of covered the heyday of the American print renaissance. If you stuck it out this long, kudos to you. You're either a really good friend or, uh, I don't know, you owe me something. Uh, or you have some crazy weird niche interest like I have. But thanks for sticking with me. I hope you learned a lot. See ya!